everybody. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Lori Wong, and I'm a senior lecturer here at the Courtaults. And I'm absolutely thrilled to see all of you. And thank you so much for coming. I believe it stopped raining, uh, but I know it's sometimes hard to get motivated when it's um, cold and wet outside. Um, I am um, here to just tell you the kind of context for which um, this lecture is happening. Um, I am going to hand over to my colleagues, Jata and Migana. Um, we co-convene uh, the MA in um, Art History and Conservation of Buddhist Heritage. Um, this is a year-long MA program here at the Courtauld, um, and it, it sits, um, it's an interdisciplinary program. It's the only interdisciplinary program really at the Courtauld that sits between uh, the three disciplines here, because we're a small institution, so it covers um, the study of art history, conservation, and curation, but it is focused on looking at Buddhist heritage. Um, this is part of the Ho Center. Um, we have, we exist because of a, a generous donation by the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation, um, and we have a center here for the study of Buddhist heritage. Um, and we run public programs, of which this lecture is one of them. Um, we've had, this year, we've had two other lectures. Um, some of you may have been at them. Um, and we will continue to do lectures um, throughout the year. It's very important to us that we engage with um, the community. So um, thank you so much for coming. Um, and I'm going to hand over to, oh, and I should say, I have some brochures that talk about um, the conservation programs um, and that also talk about the Buddhist heritage program. So if you're interested in that, I will leave them here. Um, but I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Sujanta Megama, who's going to introduce tonight's speakers and introduce tonight's exciting lecture. So thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sujatha Megama, and I'm a senior lecturer in Buddhist art history at the Courtauld. And I too would like to welcome you all uh, warmly to tonight's event that celebrates a collaboration between Chillingstone Castle and uh, Buddhist practitioners. Now, why might a program in uh, Buddhist heritage be interested in such a collaboration? Um, we teach in an age when um, objects are being uh, returned and when um, objects um, um, or, and when museums are also being closed down. Um, and um, the accessibility of objects have become um, an important um, issue uh, for not only those of us who teach uh, Buddhist art and conservation, but for also those who curate and care for those collections, whether they're private collections or public collections. And tonight, we want to highlight one such project. Um, and we have invited um, two speakers, Ami Karik and um, Nick Swan from two different disciplines. And we hope that you will join us in uh, thinking about the kinds of issues that they're going to be um, raising and discussing in their respective talks. So the first speaker tonight is uh, Naomi Colleague. And um, Naomi has been um, the curator at Jamestown Castle in Kent since 2018. And she is a graduate of Japanese studies at the University of Oxford and the history of art and archaeology of East Asia at Salas. Um, and we, um, after Naomi uh, presents, we'll have Dr. Nick Swan, who um, is a pedologist and um, is a senior lecturer in Buddhist studies at the University of South Wales. Um, he's currently, I believe, also running an MA in uh, Buddhist studies, um, similar to us, I guess, in um, And um, both Naomi and Nick will be um, sharing with us um, their recent collaboration with uh, a Tibetan Buddhist community in the UK. Please join me um, welcoming uh, Naomi and uh, Nick. Um, to the podium, and after they finish speaking, we'll have a QA, um, and you'll get a chance to um, ask them questions. Um, please also join us for the um, reception afterwards, which will be held in a room um, down the hall, very close to this lecture theatre. So please um, join me in welcoming our speakers tonight. Thank you very much, 
for joining us uh, this evening. So, as Joshua and Marie said, um, my name is Naomi. I worked at uh, Chillingstone Castle as the curator, although I should say, um, because we are a very small museum with a small staff team, I actually cover anything to do with the collections, really. So, preventative conservation, documentation, loans, really anything to do with the quite um, diverse collections at the castle. And um, I'll be speaking for the first half of this talk, and I'll hand over to Nick, who has been advising and assisting us with the curation of the current displays and with the, the disc collection at the castle in general. But I'll just start off by telling you a little bit about the castle itself. You can see a photograph here on the screen. So the castle is a historic house with Tudor origins that was rebuilt in the 19th century to resemble a medieval castle. And it was the home of the Stretfield family from the 16th to the early 20th centuries. And it's located in Kent near the towns of Sevenoaks and Edenbridge. Um, but as you can probably tell, it's very much in the countryside. So it's um, quite a, a journey to get there, but we would be very happy to welcome you all um, when we open again on Easter Sunday, actually. We are open from April to October each year to visitors. Um, So, um, in 1955, the collector and antique dealer Dennis Eyre Bauer bought the castle and moved in with his extensive personal collections. Derbyshire in a small village and began his career as a bank clerk, but his true passion from a young age was collecting antiques. And over his lifetime, he amassed the diverse collections that you can see at the castle today. And in the 40s, he had the opportunity to set up his own antiques business, and um, he then bought the castle basically to house his business, to live in, and to set out his personal collections so that he could open it up to visitors who could buy a ticket to have a look around and um, see all, all of his collections that he'd kind of displayed around his home. Um, so Dennis lived at the castle from 1955 to 1977, apart from a five-year period which he spent in prison. Um, he was imprisoned after an incident with his fiancée during which he claimed an antique pistol he had with him went off accidentally and injured her. Um, and he was released after his trial was found to be a miscarriage of justice after five years. So he returned to the castle, um, he lived there for the rest of his life, and then he left the castle and collections to the nation in his will. So a charitable trust was set up in 1984 called the Dennis Eyre Bequest, and um, that's how the castle is sort of maintained today. And the mission of the trust is to preserve the castle and collections for future generations. So I'm going to be giving an introduction to the Buddhist collection at the castle today. Um, it is the smallest of the four main collections. So Dennis's four main collecting interests were Buddhist, Japanese, ancient Egyptian, and Stuart and Jacobite art and artifacts. So he did have very varied interests. Um, there are around 150 objects in the Buddhist collection, around 80 of which are Tibetan. And the remainder of the collection comes from a range of countries, including Japan, China and Nepal. And today, just over a third of the collection is displayed in what is known as the Buddhist room at the castle. So as far as we know, Dennis bought all of his objects from auctions or from art dealers in the UK. Um, although we do not currently know the kind of history of most of the objects, because unfortunately Dennis doesn't appear to have kept a kind of detailed inventory or record of where he bought all of his objects. Um, so further research is, is needed into the history of the objects. And there are some objects that still need to be catalogued as well. So these are just some examples of some Tibetan statues in the collection, um, two of which are on display, the Shakyamuni Buddha statue and the statue of Tsongkhapa, they are on display in our Buddhist room, and the statue of Amitayas is currently in storage. And then the collection also includes objects used for practice. 
Buddhist practice. So we have um, prayer wheels, instruments, and um, amulet cases all go in the collection as well. So um, as a bit of background as to why we were able to and decided to re-display the collection. Um, the day before I started in January 2018 um, at the castle, there was unfortunately a burst pipe which caused quite extensive water damage in the Buddhist room. So it became necessary to move the whole of the collection into storage, close the room temporarily and completely redecorate the room. So luckily there was no lasting damage to the collection and um, the incident really presented an opportunity to rethink the display of the collection. So these are some images of the displays um, pre-water leak. So the room with the rather lovely floral curtains is the Buddhist room as it was just before the water leak occurred. So the room does look quite different today. So um, the castle is a fully accredited museum today. And the transition from a private collection in the home of a collector to a museum that holds collections for the benefit of the public presents a really unique and interesting case study. And um, as I said, Dennis didn't really leave us much in the way of documentation on the collections. And the house in general does have a kind of interesting combination of looking a bit like someone's living room, but also having these kind of museum style display cases in the rooms as well. So you can kind of visually see that transition as well. Um, so there's more work to be done to research and develop and kind of learn more about the collection. So as an accredited museum, we follow the guidance and advice of the Museums Association, and in particular their um, Code of Ethics. So it um, is really relevant in the areas where it says museums should be accessible to all, should use collections for public benefit, should minimise or balance bias in interpretation, and should engage and work in partnership with communities and as wide an audience as possible. So it's therefore necessary to consider these standards for the new Buddhist room displays and to consider current approaches in displaying Buddhist material in museums. The mission of the Dennis Eyre Bao bequest or the castle is to preserve Bao's collections in his home for the benefit of the public. But my main question when planning the Buddhist room displays was, should we continue to display the collection as Dennis did? So I conducted research into Dennis's displays and his understanding of the Buddhist collection and um, I focused in particular on the Tibetan objects because they do make up just over half of the collection. And I looked into the kind of resources on Buddhist art and Buddhism that were available to Dennis at the time and the attitudes that he may have been influenced by. And the aim was to decide basically on the most appropriate way of um, redisplaying the collection. So although Dennis did not leave us an accessions register, um, he did leave notes and labels and letters and newspaper clippings and all sorts of um, interesting resources in the archive. And um, these have really formed a key resource into understanding what Dennis thought about his collection and what he knew about um, the collection. And this notebook that you can see on the screen is one of those really, really important resources. So um, Dennis wrote in it whilst he was in prison and he listed kind of key objects from his Buddhist collection from memory. And um, it's, it's interesting, it gives us really an initial idea as to what he valued and how he kind of viewed his collection. So you can see that he noted um, the kind of estimated value of each object and he really used um, kind of auction catalogue style language. So it's clear that he was also viewing his collection from the perspective of um, an antiques business owner. 
And then there's also this really interesting letter in the archive from Alexandra David Nell, a famous 20th century explorer in Tibet. Um, it appears that Dennis asked her to translate one of the inscriptions on one of his tankers or Tibetan paintings. Um, and then she replied with this letter. And he kept it with a um, newspaper clipping of her obituary. So he clearly admired her. And books in the library suggest he was particularly fascinated by Tibet and exploration in Tibet, which was a popular interest in the West in the early 20th century when Dennis began collecting. And um, the library books, his um, books that he left um, with the castle, are a really useful resource as well. Um, so amongst the books are accounts of the British Young Husband Expedition um, of 1903 to 1904, which was sent to establish trade relations with Tibet, but was notorious for the violence and looting carried out by the British troops. And there's also a copy of the late 19th century work Buddhism of Tibet or Lamaism by L. Austin Waddell, which was a popular Victorian period to Tibetan Buddhism and collecting Tibetan objects, but it did present a derogatory and orientalist attitude. Um, the library mostly consists of reference books that Dennis used for his four main collections. So it is reasonable to assume that Dennis would have used these kind of books as references to inform his collecting. So it's important to note that Dennis identified as a Buddhist. Um, so we have here a letter from the Buddhist visitor of Wormwood Scrubs Prison um, addressed to Dennis. And Dennis's Buddhist beliefs were actually apparently used as an argument in his defense at his trial. Um, and we also have many of Dennis's copies of the Buddhist Society journal issues still at the castle. Um, according to the book Beyond Belief, which was written by a close friend of Dennis's, Mary Eldridge, about their kind of relationship, um, Dennis was close friends with Christmas Humphreys, the founder of the Buddhist Society. And the book states that Dennis and Christmas Humphreys were both Buddhists, but Dennis apparently was just a romantic who was attracted by the beautiful imagery of Buddhism. Um, it's really interesting that the many, many of the articles and adverts in these copies of the Buddhist Society journal that Dennis um, kept, again, reflected attitudes towards Tibet and Buddhism typical of the early to mid 20th century. So, um, the kind of themes that come across quite strongly are a focus on Western interpretations of Buddhism, comparing Buddhist ideas with Western psychology, and there are also quite a few adverts for the Theosophical Society, um, the Theosophical Society Bookshop, um, which was a society founded in the late 19th century in America, which focused on exploring the occult, magic, and Eastern religions. So again, all these things just give us an idea as to what kind of um, influences Dennis would have been kind of exposed to. So these are some photographs of Dennis's Buddhist room, which is actually now the Egyptian room at the castle today, because the rooms have been sort of moved around a few times since Dennis lived at the castle. Um, and we can really see from these photographs that Dennis displayed his collections in a cabinet of curiosities style. So we had objects crowded into these wooden cabinets with a few labels dotted here and there. Um, and he occasionally appears to have displayed objects of similar types together. So for example, prayer wheels or statues of the Buddha, but there does not appear to have been any particular themes or narratives explored in the displays. And I'll just mention quickly a bit of the history of the Cabinet of Curiosities. So um, these were rooms or cabinets in which natural history collections and curiosities from around the world were displayed, which became popular in the homes of the wealthy in Europe in the 15th century. And the aim was to really collect and classify strange, rare, or mysterious objects to understand more about the world. And the owner of the cabinet could invite friends and acquaintances to view it. 
and they could really sort of show off their collection and impress visitors with their ability to bring all of these objects together into their home. So in a similar way, the aim with Dennis's displays appears to have been to impress his visitors with the quantity and the beauty of the objects rather than to provide information on their original context or meaning. And you can really see the Cabinet of Curiosity's um, style is code in the way he had objects hanging from the ceiling or placed on the mantelpiece or on benches or even on the floor, just really sort of filling the whole room with his um, Buddhist collection. And these are just a few more photographs from the archive which illustrate how Dennis displayed and treated his Buddhist collection before he moved to the castle. And um, you can see Buddha statues crowded onto his favourite desk at home in Derbyshire, and um, you can kind of get the sense that his Buddhist collection was a key part of his identity, and he really lived surrounded by his collection in his home. So another great resource is Dennis's labels, which he wrote by hand. Um, so he did include a few labels in his displays, which kind of give a brief introduction to the objects, but it's clear that they have them um, little or no explanation of terms or sort of historical background and there are also labels which as with the um some of the articles in the buddhist society journal issues that he would have read focused on the mysterious and magical image of tibetan buddhism and demonstrated a western or christianity centric attitude towards the objects um a good example is the label for a um, Tibetan deity Paladin Lamo, who is described in Dennis's uh, label as the Great She Devil. That's that's one example. Um, then just below is a label written about Dennis's displays, most likely by early custodians or trustees of the castle after Dennis died. Um, and it basically sums up Dennis's displays quite well. So it explained that Dennis considered the context and the history of the objects to be of secondary importance to their aesthetic qualities um, and that does come across again clearly in his displays um, it appears that he also used his imagination in his um, labels as well so it describes how dennis used to call a vessel in his collection the dalai lama's teapot um, whereas this label obviously appears to be skeptical as to whether or not that's correct so these are some images of the Buddhist room today and a few different versions of the displays that we've had over the past few years. So really the main conclusion of my research into the archive was that the way in which Dennis displayed and interpreted his Buddhist collection erased or obscured the object's original context, meaning in particular sacred significance. Um, his understanding and interpretation of the collection appears to have been influenced by early to mid-20th century attitudes towards Tibetan Buddhism and Buddhism in general, which tended to view it from a position of colonial superiority. So the aim with the new Buddhist displays at the castle was to move away from presenting the objects solely as Dennis's curiosities and to explain the original context and uses and significance of the objects to the people who made and, and used them and um, to Buddhist people today. Um, so we wanted to add further voices and, and perspectives into the displays. So I researched the way in which Buddhist objects are displayed and treated in other museums. And um, one key change that I'll just mention that we've made following this research and consultation of members of the Buddhist community was no longer placing statues at floor level because we did used to have um, quite a few statues kind of crowded into the bottom shelf of one of the display cases which were basically at um, floor level because um, we have learned that statues if possible should be placed sort of at eye level or above um, and that's because once consecrated a statue of a deity is treated with the same level of respect and care as if it were the deity itself. So that's one of the key kind of changes that we've made in the room. 
I will just talk a little bit about a few practical considerations, however, because um, you know, we are in a historic house setting, we have quite limited resources and members of staff, unfortunately, and display space available. And um, one of the things we had to consider was the weight and size of some of the statues. So um, obviously changing that um, kind of level of display meant that some of the statues currently can't be displayed, but we're working on trying to raise the funds for a new display case to solve that issue. And there are also various sort of condition issues that needed to be considered and the environmental conditions in the castle and so on. So I'll just talk a little bit about one project in particular um, to redisplay the collection of tankers or Tibetan paintings at the castle. So Dennis owned around 13 tankers. Um, these are paintings which can be rolled up and transported or hung in a sort of altar or temple setting. They usually depict a central deity surrounded by associated deities or um, sometimes a lineage or, or story of a uh, particular important teacher. Um, so Dennis mostly displayed his tankers in these kind of glazed Western style picture frames. Apologies for the slightly strange angle of that photograph, but hopefully it gives you an idea. Um, and again, this is kind of an illustration of the Western style display of these tankers. So um, they've been adapted and altered to fit um, within these glazed picture frames. And we unfortunately discovered when we had some of them removed from the frames that they've been folded and kind of taped into the frames with masking tape, which obviously is not very good for them from a um, you know, preservation perspective as well. So following the removal of some of the tankers from the frames and um, the conservation of some of them, we wanted to find a way of displaying them that would take into consideration their sacred significance. So if possible, we wanted to display them without altering or damaging them further. Um, one suggestion that we did not um, choose was, for example, stitching them to a mount board, which obviously would kind of alter or damage the original fabric and also would prevent us from viewing the backs of the tankers. And, um, most of them have really beautiful different fabrics on the back of them and inscriptions and even one has a handprint as well. So there's really, really important information um, that can be found on the backs of the tanks as well. So we worked with a conservator, Karen Horton, who specialises in tankers and who works on the um, tankers collection at the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin. And she developed this um, magnet mount system for them. So they're basically adhered to a magnetic backboard with um, colour matched magnets so that they can be put on display and removed without causing any damage or um, intervention to the original material. And they can be removed from display really, really easily to be able to view um, the backs of them. And because we have such limited display space in the Buddhist room, we're only able to display one at a time. So it does just mean that it's very easy to you know, put them on display and, and take them off again. I wanted to talk a bit about that project in particular. So, in order to ensure that we're displaying the Buddhist collection accurately and respectfully and to bring other voices and perspectives into the displays other than just Dennis's voice, um, we've consulted members of the Buddhist and Tibetan communities in the UK on the new displays. So in 2018 and 2019, we organised visits for members of the Buddhist group Bodhichaya Kent which is led by the Tibetan Buddhist master Ringo Tilka Rinpoche. And the members viewed some of the stored collection and were able to spend some time in the Buddhist room for practice as well. And we were honoured that Ringo Tilka Rinpoche was able to visit to view the collection. So the photographs just show some of the stored statues arranged for a viewing as part of an event. Um, a prayer wheel, which was donated for educational purposes and handling by a member of Bodhichaira, and a note written on one of their tanker inscriptions by Ringo Tilka Rinpoche. 
Um, and in 2022, Nick facilitated a visit from Zedin Pasai um, and Tashi and Pema Murik, who were very honoured we were able to join us this evening, um, who are members of the Tibetan community in the UK. So their visit informed the current display and interpretation of the collection in the Buddhist room. So we viewed some of the Tibetan collection, they advised on how we could adapt and improve the displays. Um, I've included some images of their visit here as well. Um, great, so I will now hand over to Nick to speak more about this visit and his research into decolonization and the display of Buddhist material in museums. <laughs> thanks, Naomi, and um, thanks for inviting me to talk today. Um, so, last year I had published um, an, an article in a journal for the British Association for Study of Religion, which I understand that several people in the room have actually read, which is uh, simultaneously flattering but mildly terrifying in terms of. Um, I'm not sure what kind of questions I'm going to get at the end of this session. So I didn't want to just regurgitate that paper. You can read it, you have read it, that, that's all fine. But I want to kind of give, um, uh, say, extend on some of the ideas that are in that paper on, on either end of it, but also um, harmonize with some of the things within that. So give a bit more context to, uh, to that paper and to the uh, decolonization exercise that I helped to facilitate at Chinneyston as well. So I'll talk specifically about that, but a little bit of, of other sort of lecturing things I decided to. <coughs> Excuse me. So I began the article with a quote from Jonathan Waters, the um, North American historian of religion with a focus on Buddhism and Buddhism in Sri Lanka. I, um, I saw him give a keynote speech at a conference a few years ago, and I, I haven't seen him publish anything on that, the subject matter from that keynote speech. But it was fascinating because he focused on um, the, the way that uh, Christian missionaries, British Christian missionaries, uh, tried to frame Buddhism um, and also Islam in order to kind of uh, make Christianity the, the obvious, the natural choice for the people of Sri Lanka. So Buddhism was framed as being something that's passive, um, that's very kind of airy, fairy, head in the clouds, spiritual. Um, you know, do what you want kind of, kind of ideas, almost to the point of being a feat. Um, Islam was configured as being uh, bounded by rules, very strict, and also very aggressive. So it was seen as the, the opposite to Buddhism. And Christianity op operated in kind of the sweet spot in the middle of that, as having enough laws and regulations, but enough room for spirituality. This is how the missionaries were trying to configure things. I don't think we need to look too far um, away from recent headlines to see how those ideas about Islam have stuck in the, in the public consciousness in the UK. And maybe some of the ideas about Buddhism are in there too. Um, he goes on, he went on to talk about specifically this, uh, this hymn, this missionary hymn, written by Reginald Heber, who spent three years in Sri Lanka. Um, I've just got the first two verses of it here. But you can see how um, the, the first verse refers to things like Greenland's icy mountains, um, Africa's sunny fountains, and he's talking about kind of indigenous groups and their own kind of understanding of the cosmos and religion, etc., et um, and how they're wrong, they're, they're, they're in error, then errors change. So there's, there's that sort of um, that framing of those ideas there. The second verse is specifically about Ceylon, Sri Lanka. Um, and you see the last two lines of that. It says, the heathen in his blindness bows down to wood and stone. So in Heber's understanding, that material culture of Sri Lanka, of Buddhist images in wood or stone, that people might make prostrations to in order to show respect, to, to gain punya, gain merit, etc., um, are just that. There's nothing it's seen as being purely a physical thing, and it's something that kind of um, uh, an infantilized person might do. So... I thought introducing that section there is, um, is relevant because of the material cultural dimensions of the, the MA here, and also Chickens and Castle and the Buddhist um, items there to, to extend on what um, Waters um, have produced. I, I do strongly recommend that people read Jonathan Waters if you want to get a good idea about the context of Buddhism uh, in, in the Western understandings of, the, of, of Buddhism. Um, I talked a little bit, I might write a little bit about kind of um, the, uh, the sort of hinge point of early understandings of Buddhism uh, in, in Europe, obviously, we're talking about, about um, that came through colonial sources, and how many of those ideas have a great deal of traction. And as um, 
people learn more, study Buddhism more, learn more about Buddhism, um, spoke to actual Buddhists, etc. Um, those ideas changed in a sort of post-war period, but the early ideas seem to have kind of got stuck. Um, I should also point out, so St. Schopenhauer um, maybe exemplifies the idea that, that Buddhism is pessimistic or something like that. I, mean, I think if you only read the, the first um, uh, noble truth, then yeah, sure, Buddhism is pessimistic. But if you read on beyond that, you'll see it actually has a solution as well. Um, and uh, Edwin Arnold, with his uh, Light of Asia poem, you know, one of the most, um, uh, say, widely read works about Buddhist the, the life of the Buddha in Victorian England, um, a very famous piece of work that would have informed people about uh, the, the Buddha's life and what Buddhism is about, written in very kind of um, uh, fanciful, florid uh, language in places, uh, is another, uh, say, um, uh, factor it, that feeds into how Bauer understood uh, Buddhism. And also, I picked these two because. I talk about the long 19th century in that article, and it just kind of covers most of it. It typically, I mean, there's no definite finishing point, but maybe the beginning of the First World War is seen as being the finish of the long 19th century, but I thought to stretch that out across there. Um, so, I'll come back to some of the things. I was gonna say, it's a bit like, um, with these early ideas of, um, of, of Buddhism from the first part of the 19th century, and colonial kind of legacy ideas, um, it's, it's frustrating for academics who hear um, these, these ideas repeated, and I do come. Up, I do speak about some specific ones a bit later. And I think it's a little bit like when um, uh, I can vaguely remember as a kid going through the dinosaur phase, and you're, you're sort of playing with bottles of dinosaurs. I don't know if anybody else did this. I'm sure some, some people did. And so you've got like a, a T-Rex and a Stegosaurus, and you're making them fight. And that, I mean, there's no way that could happen because they're separated by hundreds of millions of years. But nonetheless, that, those ideas kind of stick. You think, oh. But why can't a T-Rex fight a stegosaurus? And it's, it's that sort of misunderstanding that just gets lodged. And to be honest, for, for many people, those ideas, they're not very important in day-to-day -day life. They come and go out of their sort of um, uh, field of view, and they don't have a big impact on their life. So they don't really care particularly about up updating their, their data. But it's, it's that, that sort of thing gets stuck with, with Buddhist ideas from the, kind of, let's say, the pre-war period. Um, and one person who... Um, was very influential on Bauer, as we've heard already, was Christmas Humphreys. I think these, these two quotes do appear in, in the article, uh, but they're worth um, revisiting here. So the idea that there's never been a Buddhist war, nor has any man been killed or even injured by a Buddhist for holding a different point of view, that's highly contentious. Uh, but nonetheless, Humphreys is there as the president of the Buddhist Society uh, from, the, from its founding until his death, and so his there as a spokesperson for Buddhism, he's telling people what Buddhism is about, and so these ideas stick. And the second one about, um, uh, say, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, uh, saying, lying as it does on the fringe of the Buddhist world, this school was unaffected by development elsewhere. Ooh, I don't think anybody in Sri Lanka would like to think of themselves as being on the fringe of the Buddhist world. They're at the center of their Buddhist world, and, and it's, it seems to be a very um, objectifying, a colonial uh, approach to understanding um, the, religion, the religion in Sri Lanka. And this is the kind of Buddhism that Bauer would have been, like he would have encountered, so um, aesthetically pleasing, as, as, um, as, as Naomi pointed out in, his, um, uh, in, in her talk, and uh, you know, pacifistic as well, and so on. I'm not going to talk too much about Buddhist modernism. Um, Try and keep an eye on the time. I forgot what time I started. If, if I start to run on, just let me know. But I kind of I should be able to keep sit, sit about twenty minutes. Uh, but I haven't timed this. Um, so Buddhist modernism is a term that, that hopefully some of you are familiar with, and it really refers to this idea that uh, Buddhism, as encountered in colonial situations, isn't is, is a kind of it's a construct of its own. So um, in the face of hostility by missionaries and, and others. Uh, Buddhists in, say, Sri Lanka particularly, tended to try to present Buddhism as being like entirely rational. They came up with a new way of understanding Buddhist thought and Buddhist practice that was in line with Western rational thoughts, in line with science, and ideas about, say, um, uh, non-human entities or, uh, or worship, etc., uh, were just local cultural things, hangovers that satisfied some people in a simplistic kind of way. They weren't an integral part of, of Buddhist um, practice and so forth. Um, 
So this was identified in the, in the 1960s by Heinz Becker, the, the German um, uh, pathologist Heinz Becker, uh, who kind of set a different kind of context to try to understand, well, well, what is it that we do know about Buddhism then? If, it, well, if that's, the, those ideas were coming through in the first part of the 20th century, and that's not really how Buddhism was practiced in the countries before colonialism, what is it that we kind of really, uh, what, let, let's look again at the data that we have and try and find a new way to, to understand Buddhism. Furthermore, trying to understand Buddhism on its own terms as well, but I'll talk about that in a few moments. Um, I should also add, to, uh, for clarification purposes, that most of the things I've talked about so far is a case of European intellectuals who've encountered Buddhist thought and practice and who've turned up in their, well, back in Europe, say, and they're telling people what Buddhism is. And these, are, it would be fallacious to think that they, they discovered Buddhism, or they're the first, they were the first kind of Europeans to encounter Buddhist ideas, because that becomes like social history that goes back way before the 19th century, where you have um, encounters through trade routes, etc., with, um, with, with, with the Buddhist world. And you also have uh, Europeans who become monks in the, say, late 19th century, early, um, early 20th century, who are nothing to, they're not high profile, they're not trying to sell books, they're not trying to get a lecturing post in the UK or something like that, or proselytize. They just uh, became attracted to, to uh, Buddhism, Buddhist thought, Buddhist practice, Buddhist life, and just renounced the world and became monks. And they're, 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 there was a project at some uh, Cork University um, to find, to, to identify um, people who uh, became uh, Buddhist monks and nuns in, in, um, that, that aren't really on the radar to answer if a kind of rock star figures in, in Buddhist history. Um, so yes, we have these disjunctures between the, the, the sort of pre-war, post-war ideas about what Buddhism is. Um, so on to decoloniality, I'll come back to those disjunctures in a, in a moment. Um, I, came up, I, I thought when looking at the decolonization exercise that uh, we did at Chillingston, and when thinking about decoloniality in general, it struck me that there's, there's not just one type, there's a kind of, there seems to be a difference between um, activist uh, decolonizing practices, um, such as repatriation of human remains from museums, and as I say, fortunately, I, I, I don't know if Mary looked in every cupboard in the museum, but hopefully you haven't found anything in there that you, you sort of think that shouldn't be here. Um, or, uh, or, or say, um, I, Activities like, say, uh, uh, roads must fall, etc. Those kinds of, of activities, and the more um, educational side of it. So I thought that there's a distinction there between sort of hard decoloniality and soft decoloniality. I was thinking with soft decoloniality, it's a bit like sort of soft power. So it's a, it's a sort of a gentle suggestions here and there to try to influence people, rather than saying, "Here's an agenda. We want these results at the very end of it," and that, that, those, those sorts of things. Um, a colleague of mine at the University of South Wales, a former colleague, uh, gave a really good description of what decoloniality is, particularly, say, soft decoloniality. And he said it's like if you're trying to, um, uh, if you're trying to explore a cave and you've got, say, one candle and you're walking around it, you can see the shapes and the contours of the walls and maybe there's a drawing here or there or something like that, and you get a, a sense of what the cave is about, that's like the kind of the... Um, the uh, colonized approach, if you like, with just the one candle. And he said what decoloniality does is it brings more candles into the cave, so you can see more of the walls and see more of the kind of the layout of the cave and understand it better. It is not about snuffing that first candle out and replacing it with another candle to wander around the cave with. So I think it is an important consideration, especially with its, I don't know, the, the standard of rhetoric these days on, on things like decoloniality and sort of wokeness, et cetera, that it's not about cancelling voices, it's about bringing other voices to the discussion. So nobody's trying to sort of stifle or, or deny a kind of a colonial past. They're trying to say, well, let's look at it with other, from other perspectives too. Let's look at it from the perspective of the colonised. Let's try to kind of bring more light into the cave. But it's not a case of cancelling any voices. Which is why I think with this, um, the activities at Chillingston do this very well, because of Bauer's understanding and the context of the... Of the, of the um, uh, of, of the collection altogether is really well um, preserved. preserved uh, is, I'm not sure it's the right word, but uh, it's, con it's, it's there, it's contextualized, it's, it's not being kind of cancelled, his, his words aren't being removed from that, and it's, it's kind of, he lives on in the collection. And it also links to this, uh, this uh, sort of quote from, from Santos, uh, that the 
let's understand the coexistence of many knowledges in the world and the relation between the abstract hierarchies which constitute them all, unequal and e unequal economic and political power relations. So it's trying to just um, acknowledge this and address it to bring more voices to the discussion and to listen to those voices and not just from your own kind of, um, through your own lens, try to understand them on their own terms. Because part of the, um, well, actually, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this and I'll come back to that, that strand in a second. So, um, this is a bit of a break. So, we get these, these ideas that you know, the, the, um, the Buddha was plus sized. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever had this. If you're, if, uh, I've never had it with an MA student, but with undergraduates uh, on the first sort of few sessions of teaching uh, Buddhist studies with them, uh, there'd almost always be one who, when you say any questions about something, you know, a lecture that's nothing to do with. Um, with this particular subject, they say, oh, you know, why was the Buddha fat or something like that? And he said, well, but he, we have no evidence that he was. And they'll say, oh, yeah, but in the garden centre, there's a statue of the Buddha. And he's like, it's really, and you think, go into your degree at the garden centre then. And it's, it, we come back to that idea about this sort of the, the Stegosaurus and Tyrannosaurus fighting and, and those sorts of things. It, it doesn't help that Budai, the character that is plus sized, um, Buddha sounds very much like Buddha to somebody who doesn't isn't that interested, isn't paying attention. But Buddha means kind of a, a knapsack, doesn't it? Sort of backpack, that, that sort of thing. So um, that's one idea. But but it's a peaceful. Um, yeah, sure. That that's there doctrinally that we should avoid onslaught onto other beings if we're, if we're Buddhist. Um, that doesn't play out in reality, though. We, you, you don't have to look too far to find instances of, of, of Buddhists. Um, committing violence and the Buddhist monks inciting violence. So uh, there is a disjunction, a disjunction there, certainly. And Buddhism is more of a philosophy than a religion. Uh, this is deeply problematic because Buddhism is a Western construct, <laughs> and philosophy and religion are both Western terms. And for a Buddhist um, monk or nun, um, trying to frame this question would just be confusing as anything. Just, they think that these are all like, sort of terms, none of these terms relate to me, so why are you trying to analyze me for terms that I can't relate to at all? So it becomes a, a, a big kind of problem. So it's why you know, one Western construct is more of a different type of Western construct than another type of Western construct. It it's all kind of falls into that, 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 sort of, um, uh, uh, that category. So just a couple more slides. I'm, I'm not going to talk too much longer. Um, in terms of decolonizing the curriculum, the main um, effort that I see is really trying to move on from understanding Buddhist thought in Eurocentric terms. So using uh, the, the terminology from um, European philosophy, from Western philosophy, to try to understand, uh, say, Buddhist <coughs> ethics or Buddhist philosophy, when both of those are actually a little problematic. I mean, the, the term shila in, um, uh, in, in Sanskrit means it gets translated as ethics, but the literal translation is cooling. So it's far more about what, what that's supposed to do to you rather than to have you sort of thinking about what you're doing. It's just trying to kind of cool the passions so you can meditate, you can sit on the cushion without distractions. Um, and not treating, I think Maria Hine puts this really, really well, uh, very concisely, in that it's, it's not assuming that Western categories are somehow true in an absolute way and valid across whole range of other ways of thinking, and that all those other ways of thinking are merely data to be sort of run through Western categories with a judgment popping out the other end. It's, it's trying to understand these Buddhist concepts on their own terms. Of course, people need to get a toehold on the subject before they can move on. So yeah, sure, why not have some scaffolding up there with familiar philosophical terms? But um, with the, the, the MA that I teach on, I try to remove those as quickly as possible, as soon as people see that actually they can see it in a different way. That's what, uh, that's what I'm for. Um, and decolonizing museum practices. So I will talk about a couple of, of incidents at the uh, Chinese Castle um, uh, episode, um, exercise. Uh, but I also note that it's not possible at Chillingston to necessarily kind of acquire new material. So you can't have new Tibetan um, art being commissioned or, or being bought to give a, a fresh um, understanding of Tibet as a living culture. Um, unlike, say, uh, National Museums Liverpool, where they had uh, Gong Kargetsa's prints of, uh, of my identity. I was trying to find an image of this um, to pull up, but I couldn't get online. Um, I think the Boston Museum of Art has a, has a, a copy of it. Um, 
but it basically shows the artist Gon Cagliasso photographed in four different similar but um, similar poses, but with different outfits on, uh, tracking his own um, journey through life as, a, as, a, as, a, as an artist who grew up in Tibet. Uh, with um, he was very, his family, his, his mother and father were um, Communist Party members and were ardently um, uh, 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 communist. Um, and he only found out there was an alternative to that sort of later in life. Um, so I did want to show this partly because I, I, um, I used to share a flat with Gonkar when he lived in London first in the 1990s. So I, I was going to sort of share an anecdote about his, his um, uh, graduate show, but maybe over, over tea later. I might, well, we'll leave that for now. Um, so yes, we had uh, Naomi, uh, when we met in February uh, two years ago now, is it 20, yeah, 2022? Um, who can see uh, Pema and Tashi Muri and uh, Sony Passani in the photos there, and Naomi sitting there too. Um, and we, we looked at about maybe a dozen items um, handled in this, this way. So Naomi told us about how to you know, wear gloves, uh, handle objects low over the table in case you drop them, etc. Um, and this gal was one of the, one of the first items out of the box. And I, I think, well, as soon as you, you picked it up, Tashi, you, the first thing you did was instinctively just opened it. And I'm not sure that anybody had opened it since the, the Tibetan closed it sometime, maybe, or decades, or decades earlier. Um, and it did, it demonstrated that that was, you know, you knew there were things in there, and it was, well, what does this say about this person's life? What's going to be sort of um, uh, hiding in there that the person had found important? And um, as, as I think I say, it was, it's, the idea of opening was beyond curatorial prurience <laughs> at, that, at that particular point in time. Um, uh, maybe especially without it being sort of documented any kind of way. But inside the, uh, there was a, a, a little um, sasa image, a, a pressed clay image of Bhairava, um, and a, a sundu kind of uh, cord, a um, piece of cloth with a knot in it that you tie around your neck, and it, the, a lama would have blown a blessing into the knot for your protection. So it's a sundu, a, a protection knot. Um, and Selling said they had, it has a, a, this is the color chakra, a ten, ten syllable color chakra mantra in a stylized form on the cover of that gown. And uh, Selling pointed out that he has, he's got one of those hanging in his car, like a, a similar kind of modern, modern day image. I tried to buy some, it was in Kathmandu in the summer uh, last year, and I tried to buy some amulets like that. I couldn't find anywhere selling them. I could only find like stickers, color chakra stickers, but I'll, I'll keep looking next time I'm there. As I thought it would be maybe. Um, could open up a connection to the, the gift shop at Chillingston, so you could maybe buy, buy one of those on the way out if it, if it, if it resonated with you. Or to display in the cabinet, uh, juxtapose perhaps to, the, uh, to that girl too. Um, and very few, more, very few, few slides now. Um, this uh, Chiluk, or as, as described as a ewer, so, you know, pour the jug for pouring things, um, uh, is uh, was being displayed slightly incorrectly. So it comes with a bowl, I don't have a picture of it, a bowl and a, a cup. Um, and the, the, the cup was the side of the bowl, it should be inside it. And the idea is you pour water from that uh, tulip over a little round mirror called a melon, this polished piece of metal, um, really with a few dots inscribed on it. And whatever is reflected in that mirror gets purified by the water um, that's coming out of there. I thought it's, it's really interesting because the provenance of this item um, if you don't know already, it was a gift from the Panchen Lama, described as the Tashi Lama by, uh, by Bauer, uh, to um, Lord Minto, the Viceroy of India, in, I think it was about 1905, I can't remember the exact date. Um, and there's a description there from Bauer's notes about what would happen to things that were gifted to um, governors and dignitaries and so on, um, if they didn't necessarily want to keep them. So. If a gift like that would be given to the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the viceroy, if he didn't want it, he couldn't keep it personally without paying for it, but he might want to keep it in his office or have it in his estate or something like that. If he didn't want it, it might be passed on to some other government official who might want to keep it in their kind of, um, uh, in their state-owned collection, not their personal collection. Um, and eventually it would, it would just be sold to an art dealer on the open market. And so this was sold to someone called um, Sir Houghton Stokes, which I think is a great name. I think if there was ever like a, a kind of a quiz game called something like, 
is it a kind of a scar DJ or scar MC or colonial administrator? Hope and Stokes would be a great fun, a person to include in that game. Um, and it eventually, it was bought by Bauer. Uh, the, there's some contradictory notes, I think, between this and another side, with the label that Bell used. Because in this one, I think it says it's kind of, um, it could be late 18th through to 19th century, but he positions this as being 18th century in the, in the actual label, because that gives it more kind of charisma. The older it is, the more kind of like exotic it is. But it might be a bit later. I don't know, I know very little about Chinese croissant work, apart from as I understand it, the kind of the, it peaks sometime in the mid late nineteenth century. I'm happy to be correct on this because I really, really don't know much about it. Um, I would imagine maybe it's more more at that end, so it's a, a better example of that. But this is a a, a, a gift between um, a really senior Tibetan dignitary, like right up at the top, um, and the viceroy of India. It symbolises a, a political connection. Um, there was a, there was a, a, a reason why the Panchalama was in, in India and reaching out to Minto. Uh, I won't go into detail about that. I don't know enough about it. But it was a, a, a kind of a, a political point, really. Here. I've just got a couple more things to say. Um, in the extension at the other end of this, um, uh, Naomi and I are hoping to uh, run a, a short project on how people encounter these objects uh, when they visit the castle. So what what is, how are they constructed by by people who visit? Um, how are they understood? And how do you, how do they ontologically construct what they encounter in the castle? What does the object mean to them? By this, I mean some objects might be met with indifference. You know, people just pass through. It looks pretty. Don't really care. Look next room, please. That kind of thing. Some they might see a beauty in them. They might consume them for their aesthetics. And this is maybe a bit of a misunderstanding. Certainly with um, Tibetan Buddhist um, art in inverted commas, as. Uh, well, I remember I was at a place called the Lukang in, um, in Lhasa once, a very long time ago, and I got told off by a monk because I described some of the murals in the Lukang as being Yinjebo, so the Rimo Pesa uh, Yinjebo, something like that, sorry. Um, and he just went, and he said that, you know, they're not Yinjebo, they're Yabbo, they're good. Yinjebo means beautiful, it means there's something sort of pretty and, and lovely and magical and captivating about them. But that's the wrong word to use when you're describing. Buddhist art, certainly the Lukang with that Tibetan monk, and he said there should be yadpo, the good. If you don't see something good when you see a Buddhist image, it's, that's your fault. You're not seeing the intrinsic nature of that item as being kind of um, uh, the best representation of that is that that person could produce. Um, other things being historically significant, such as that chilu, do they mark a moment in time and, and are evidence for something, for a connection between two countries um, that's is, is often overlooked. Or are they constructed as being actual deities? You know, are these things that are there in, the, in, in the cabinets seen as being actual deities themselves? I'm not sure that would be the case with many of Chillingston's um, uh, statues because if they were um, at one point um, consecrated mid ravnics if they would be filled with, say, incense and semi precious stones and so on, and had the mantra of the deities um, wrapped around spindles, etc. Um, those were plundered before they ended up at Chillingston. So they've already been kind of uh, desecrated somewhere else and then they've ended up on the market and they've been, they've been there. So it's maybe not quite the same as that. Um, so, yeah, to try to better understand the cohesions of many, many knowledges of, um, in the world, in, in, in the sense of trying to understand how different people construct and understand these, uh, these images. I've just got. Um, I don't really have a, a specific conclusion to make about that. I hope you've sort of found it interesting. But I would like to say that uh, we're meeting here today on the 12th of March, and that is Tibetan Women's Day. And it commemorates the Tibetan women's uprising in Lhasa in 1959 in response to the Chinese invasion. So I think it's, uh, um, I'm happy to be able to, to mention that here in the context of a Tibetan collection and with Tibetans in the audience as well. Um, I'll stop there. I think. Thank you.